Hello, my name is Shavina Baker, and I am the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Educator for the Illinois CTE Project team. I am coming to you today with our Trailhead series. This episode will be focusing on entrepreneurship as well as human resources. We began this Trailhead series as a direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Most of our students were not able to get onto work sites or internships and apprenticeships. So therefore, we created a series where our students would be able to dial into industry professionals to learn more about their careers and their backgrounds in hopes that it would inspire them to look into those career pathways. And today we have Mrs. Rebecca Francis. Welcome, Rebecca, to the Trailhead series. Thank you for having me. If you would, just give us a little bit of information about who you are, as well as a little bit about your background. Well, I'm Rebecca Francis. I am a entrepreneur by day, but I am a business professional, an HR professional, and a public policy professional. So a lot of the work that I do um, from my entrepreneurship journey is stemmed, um, well, it's in collaboration with HR and public policy. A lot of people, I like to say, will call me when there's an um, discrepancy and how their policies show up in their organization, which pairs with HR, however, from an equitable lens. And so um, a little bit about the work that I do from that aspect. I also look at um, entrepreneurship as an additional avenue by, um, I have two or three different side businesses that I do that also align with equity in some way, um, such as the hair vending machines that I use for African-American students in college um, settings. Um, so that's just a little bit about me, but I love um, to support and serve um, within the capacity of um, DEI. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So you indicated that you are an HR professional and an entrepreneur. Can you tell me a little bit about what excites you most about your job? Yeah. Um, one of the things that probably excites me most is when I wake up in the morning, I realize that there is impact. Um, sometimes when you go to a nine to five, which is nothing wrong with that, if it's not a career of choice may feel more like a job. Um, when I wake up in the morning, I feel excited to go to, um, clients or people that actually called me, um, which means that they needed me. And that feels good to know that, um, what I have to offer is something that people can utilize or they feel is inspirational to them. Um, it's also something, it's nice when um, you can see organizations transform over time through concepts or theories that you studied or you thought um, would work, but maybe in a traditional setting of a nine to five would not be able to offer. Um, so to be able to be the person that people call to test things out or to support them, you know, feels good. So what I would say is when I wake up in the morning, I feel proud um, of the impact that I get to make and I get to do that. Um pretty much at my own time frame and time limit, which is nice. Awesome. So being an HR professional, many of our students may not know what that means and human resources professional is what we're discussing. So could you tell us a little bit about what that entails and what that means? Yeah. So I think of human capital. That's the best way to look at it. Anybody in an organization, um, they need you. So it's almost, I tell a lot of my HR friends that you're like the mom of the organization or you're the dad of the organization. When there is an issue or someone needs support, they come to you. And a lot of the equity work that I do when it comes to um, sexual harassment, I remind people very often that your HR department are the people that you get to go to and share what you may not be able to share with your supervisor, or um, if there's an issue, a discrepancy, those are the people that can solve your problem. And so when they're those, they're they're the people that care about human capital. They're supposed to care about the well-being of those in the organization. They're supposed to fight for the people um, that need support and don't have a voice or don't feel like they have a voice. Um, so HR is a very special um, role in the organization um, because essentially they are what I would call the central hub of everything. And so translating that into your ability to be a human resources professional, but you're also a business owner. So could you talk to us just a little bit about how you take your skill sets and then use that and, and then work that into a business model? Yeah. So a lot of times, and this is just my own experience, 
when you work in some organizations, um, not my first job, but my second job, I learned that um, sometimes HR is not allowed to really serve the people um, the way they really want to. Um, sometimes there is someone tying their hands, whether it's politically driven or just because they don't want to. And so I found that being a business owner, I was able to step out of the organization and actually be the fixer of the problems that maybe HR could not say. And so when they have a consultant, a lot of times the consultant can say all the things that the HR professional cannot say, um, which works in my favor because then I still get to leave, right? By leaving a mark, supporting HR, and also saying, hey, this is not right and we have to fix this without the HR department feeling like they're gonna lose their job um, because sometimes that is the case. Um, so I, I've learned that from the HR standpoint, point taking my skill set and going in and actually being a support to the HR professionals while keeping equity as the forefront of what we do um, is how we're able to kind of show up for HR. Awesome. And so can you talk to me just a little bit about some of the challenges that you might have in, in the career path that you're on? Oh yeah, there's lots of those. Um, one of the challenges would probably be that um, people don't like to be told the truth. Um, a lot of times um, it's very difficult to have hard conversations with people that may be stuck in their ways or um, don't want to evolve. And that can become a hard conversation. Um, and so I've had to learn over the past almost three years now that having hard conversations are good. Um, and I have to be honest with every single person that I work with, because if I don't, I'm essentially not helping anything and I've left them the same way that, you know, I came in. So I have to be honest. And that maybe is the hardest part because when you don't know people or they don't have a loyalty to you, they don't feel that they need to listen to you and they can just dismiss you. And if this is my job, I, I want them to like me so that I get paid. Right. But I'm finding that honesty actually is what gets you paid. And so a lot of times people are not looking for someone to rub their back. They're looking for someone to tell them the truth. And that can be hard to be bold and do that. So um, that's taken years of, you know, trial and error to get to this point, but I can firmly stand in the truth and know that even if I don't get asked back that I did what I was supposed to do. Awesome. Awesome. So let's shift gears here just a little bit. Um, did you know that you wanted to go into human resources when you were in high school? And if not, what did you want to be when you grew up? No, I actually still want to be when I grow up a attorney and a judge. So I'll be going to law school next. But um, I had a baby um, in, in college, which um, shifted a lot of the work that I wanted to do because she was sick. Um, and I had to attend to her. So I was grateful because my first career um, allowed me to kind of move up the ladder um, without really, I didn't have many credentials at all at the time. Um, but one thing that I enjoyed was what I was doing there. And I wanted to be proven worthy <laughs> of that position. So I got my degree in what I was doing, um, which was heavily populated in people and human capital and how people showed up to work and it was just all HR related, um, which is still so valuable and relative today. And no matter what career I choose, I can always still go back to HR and I have that experience. Um, and so I would I would have to say, I always wanted to be a judge and attorney and I still will be, but um, I had to take a shift when I had a child um, in college and I had an opportunity to move into another career path, which was still a huge blessing as a single mom you know, to even scale at 60 and 70 K at my age. I think I was like 24 when I started that career. And, um, that was still a huge blessing for me. So, um, I don't really regret that opportunity. I think that it was the pathway I needed to go down because now companies need me to expound on, you know, what I learned in that setting on like, you know, different levels now. So it was a, it was a good shift. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we know that students um, may not always take a very linear path to, to their education. So I really appreciate you sharing that information um, with our viewers. Um, what would you say um, or give advice to for young people who may be watching this video? How could they become successful in, in the career path that you chose? What would be some of the advice that you would give them? 
Well, I definitely say before you go to school, know why you're doing it. Um, I think a lot of times in the college career setting, we don't tell them, or no one told me at least, um, choose a career that you, not about money, right? Because I think when I was like, well, I'm being an attorney and a judge, my concept was that that person makes a lot of money. Um, but I never thought about what I enjoy most. And I really, really love to help people. I love to get people to an aha moment. Um, and HR allows us to have um, direct communication with people. Um, and that was something I enjoyed. I enjoyed um, the excitement of people. I enjoy even the bad conversations that I feel like happen, you know, because it's still all enlightening, but you have to kind of know why you're doing those things. And so um, I had to get there organically because I didn't expect this turn in my career, but I think that a lot of people could mitigate um, having to go down a detour route if they um, kind of just think through what they want to do in advance and then kind of put the proper steps in place and then also mitigate any barriers that would hinder them from getting there. And so um, I would say just kind of assessing what you, and there's lots of tests online that you can kind of think about as far as a career path, because everything's not traditional, but um, whatever that pathway looks like for you, kind of get on that path so you can be good at it, you know, earlier than I'm what, I'm, I'm 32. I'm just getting good at something, right? Like at 32, whereas as there are people that I know that got good at their careers right at, out of college at 22 years old, they've been working in their career for almost a decade before I got to where I am, which means that you would be more of the expert in the field and you would probably be making way more than a person like myself, you know, at this time because you were concentrated in a path. So that's what I would say. Could you talk to us a little bit about education, um, Mrs. Francis? What was required, the minimum requirements for you to become a human resources um, professional? Yeah, you have to have a bachelor's for sure. Um, you have to have HR. I did business HR as mine. However, most people go into HR management or some type of HR degree and then they get their SHRM. Um, I know that SHRM is not necessarily is a must, um, but it helps you to understand the details of what you'll experience in an HR setting. Um, for me personally, I didn't need any of those things because the career path that I took, um, the business degree was good enough with HR as a concentration, um, but to work in public policy and the government, I did need that. So, you know, those Sometimes, depending on the career that you align yourself with, you just don't want to get random degrees, which is what I tell um, all the kids that I know. Um, don't go to school and just pick a random degree because it sounded good or it sounded easy. Pick something that is going to get you to the next level and that the coursework is aligning to something you need to know for like from a knowledge standpoint. So that's kind of how I look at picking a career. But from an HR standpoint, really, you just need that bachelor's um, concentrate in something that has something to do with HR to show yourself approved. And then you can go um, into something further for certification if you really want to. And the SHRM is a human resources certification. Correct. Right. Yeah. Awesome. That's, so like any other, like if you were to take your bar exam or whatever, that's the exam that you would take to be the certified HR professional. So you talked about some barriers um, and your focus specifically on inclusion and equity work within your human um, resources professional work. Um, can you talk to me just a little bit about how students can overcome or eliminate some of the barriers to becoming a human resources professional? Yeah, I would say number one is advocate for yourself. Um, a lot of people sit there and wait <laughs> and hope that someone is going to see or acknowledge what it is they're asking for and whatever that is. Um, but you really won't get there that way. Um, I've learned that at 32, um, but I would would have loved to have known that at 22, right? That if you know that there's something you need to get to the next level, that you feel bold enough um, to stand up for yourself and say what it is, people actually respect that a lot more um, than just being quiet. Um, and I've learned that, um, but that took years in coaching and, you know, things like that. But if you can hear it now, then you can kind of start working on how, and how does that look when I talk about advocating for yourself? If you see discrimination or you see, or you notice that someone is getting an opportunity over you, or you notice that um, someone that may, um, 
have the advantage for whatever reason, whether it's classism or et cetera, that you're able to actually call that out, right? Um, because a lot of times if it goes under the rug, then they'll say, oh, well, they saw it, but you know, I'm going to keep going. So um, I know adv advocating for yourself is definitely number one. I would say number two is assessing how um, your current situation is set up. So if you know that you're not super organized or you don't have things together or you haven't prepared yourself or you haven't read up enough on something or you don't really have the language to speak that you do the research. Um, because when you go places, um, they expect you to know those things. Um, and so you have to be prepared and ready at all times because you never know when the opportunity will present itself and you should be ready to kind of hit the ground running. And that's how you really eliminate most barriers. I always tell people not to internalize um, things like racism or things like that because it is an additional barrier. Um, it's okay to assess, notice, call it out and move on. And so I really push, especially um, African-Americans, to assess the barrier, but then call it out and find a solution opposed to stay there. And so I noticed those are really the the two barriers that I see in today's society with the people that I work with is either not advocating for themselves, not having a clue of what they're doing or why they're doing it and how they're going to get there. And then that portion of internalizing and taking things really personal that hinders them from moving forward. Thank you for sharing that information. I think that's very important um, to, to point out. Um, when we are talking about career and technical education specifically, part of the instruction for our students um, is something called the essential skills or the technical competencies. Can you talk to me just a little bit about the important skills that are needed um, in your particular career field? Yeah, um, and they're probably not the ones that people think. Um, <laughs> I would say the first one is definitely self-control. Um, you know, one of those, it's a skill, um, that a lot of people don't think about, um, when you go places like there has to be a level of, um, confidence, but it also has to have that piece of being able to handle what happens in the moment and then being able to problem solve that, which is the next one. Problem solving for me is huge because my entire job is solving people's problems and most times has always been to some extent. Um, and so I don't think I've ever had a part of my career that hasn't been solving a problem. And I noticed that um, people get paid big money to solve problems. Like that's it, that's all. Like the highest paid people in the world are problem solvers. And that is a skill that um, if you can assess things as growth areas, opposed to looking at them as barriers, then you can solve problems. And so that would be um, the second one. I would also say um, empathy um, being a skill set. I know that is more of an attribute for some people, but everyone does not possess empathy. Um, you know, and I think that um, when you have empathy as a skill set or an aspect of your toolbox, then you actually can see things from a different lens. And that also is what sets people apart in their job. I would also say communication. Um, communication is huge. Um, if you cannot communicate yourself, um, if you don't have the right words to use, um, I'm not saying that you have to be um, like this, you know, as a speaker, but you have to be able to articulate yourself. Um, a lot of times I see people run circles around people in meetings because they know they don't know what they're talking about or they know they don't know how to compete in a conversation and that is dangerous for your career. So like you have to know how to even self-reflect and then communicate. So those are um, those are the top ones for me that I've just kind of seen in today's society. I would also say some of the other ones that are maybe more technical are those tech savvies. Um, I'm learning like with using um, technology and being able to communicate technology to the people that you work with um, literally translates into all the work that you do. It makes everything work um, much smoother. And the people that are really tech savvy and have the skill set of communication and can do both together, those are the people that are literally taking this world to the next level. Um, so those are just kind of the things that I see um, right now from an HR standpoint empathy, communication, um, and being able to kind of pivot. And that's the other one, like having the heart to pivot. I don't know what the word I'm trying to use um, for the actual soft skill of that, but if you can't pivot, most times you're going to get left behind. Well, I appreciate you sharing all of that information um, with us today, and we are going to pivot.
Um, and I would really love to learn how you, um, Mrs. Francis, celebrate your successes. Um, I don't know that I actually celebrate them. I try to post on social media, um, but that's more so to gain clients <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, but the but the honest, like lately, I've been kind of self reflective on what's actually happening here. Um, sometimes we're on the go all the time. So if I'm building presentations all night and day, I don't really think about the success of it. I'm more so just trying to get through it so I can get to the next thing, right? Sure. Uh, but one of the things that recently I've been doing is write, I've been journaling um, and writing down wins. Um, and I use my passion planner to do that, partially because if I don't put a goal and then put a win next to it, then I don't see how far I've really come. Um, and to someone else who thinks I'm doing great, I may feel like I'm just lacking in all these areas, which is also um, a poor mindset to have when you're trying to get to the next level. And so um, celebrating the now is something I'm learning to do. And how I do that is I'm more so, I don't buy anything or do anything like that, but I'm more so, I even may take a break. So today, one of my successes was that I did a great presentation at nine this morning. So until my next meeting, I just sat on the couch and did things that I wanted to do, whether that was shopping for Christmas presents or you know, I gave myself grace and a break. Um, and I feel like that's one of the best ways that I can celebrate myself because I'm 90% of the time killing myself, writing presentations. And so if I have 10% of time in my schedule to give myself grace and a break, that is how I celebrate um, myself. Sometimes I may go out, like take myself out to eat or, you know, but the greatest one I would say is the self-care. Awesome. And how about the challenges? How do you recover from, I won't call them failures because we're always growing, but how do you recover from some of the disappointments or challenges? Um, One of the, I'll give two examples. I remember when I first started, I was ready to quit and just go back to a regular job because no one was returning any of my calls <laughs> and no one was, or they wouldn't return them or answer my emails or they kind of shoot the breeze with me or you know, and so I started to kind of assess how I could show up differently. And that's where my mindset shifted and post to giving up something in me just was like, no, you don't give up, you keep going. So what I did is, is I would try even harder, but in a different way. And so um, I've learned now after doing it for almost three years that now I have to just I have to pivot each time opposed to being upset. Another thing is I if I do something to harm someone or someone is not happy with me, or if I notice that I've offended someone in my work, I actually am the one to bow and I apologize immediately opposed to being defensive with um, the client or defensive with how they behaved. Um, because I'm learning that you can actually, um, you can control a fire when you're actually humble. And so people will come down on humbleness. They will not come down on, they will not come down on defensiveness. They go up. So those are the two things that I've learned on how to deal with challenges. And I've also learned to accept no as like not the final answer. So if someone says no to me, I'm not upset anymore. I just say, okay, I'll reach back out to you, you know, in six months. And so they're probably thinking to themselves, I said no, but then that will also remind them like, wait, she's coming back in six months, you know? And then if that doesn't work in six months, I may wait a year, you know? But like, I don't really give up. And most of the people that I've actually accepted the no from the first time are now clients of mine today. And they're the happiest clients that I have today. And so I think that sometimes you just can't give up. Um, and then you have to show, and that's why I post a lot on social media on what things are happening or or maybe even feedback to show people that it wasn't always good, but this is what I did to get there. And now this is what they say. So I kind of show the whole journey and I accept the failures and I accept the wins. Um, they both go hand in hand. Great, great. Well, my very final question is one of my favorites because I think that it gives students and teachers an insight of things that they may not learn about a particular career pathway. Um, what are some of the hidden things about your um, career that many may not know about? That DEI is not just about race. <laughs> That's my favorite one. <laughs> when I go places, people are already turned off like, and they don't wanna talk about the conversation 
until they really realize what it is, right? And when we start kind of going down there, I like my dad used to always say, because my dad's a pastor, he would always say at church, um, I'm getting ready to come down your row, right? Like, and so I I remind people that when I start, when I come down your row, you gonna know, right? If it hits your home, you're going to know. And and I usually spend time in every training doing that so that people understand what this really is, right? And not just that, um, I'm actually your friend. <laughs> I'm not someone here to hurt you. I'm not here to harm you. I don't have some weird political agenda. I have no agenda at all. And I also remind people that there's no way I will put a target on my back for an agenda, you know, like, so I think a lot of times when people learn that about me and they learn that about the career in which I, you know, have chosen they they come down off their defensiveness and they're more open. Um, but I have to usually explain that in the first couple meetings each time, um, because a lot of people believe that that's what it is. They also believe a lot of times that HR, um, is combined with DEI when they're completely separate things that just work together. Um, and so I have to usually bridge gaps like that in the organization too, so that people are not feuding or upset with one another. Um, because the people are, are the HR is here to serve the people and DEI is here to serve the whole organization. So, um, those are two things that I notice people probably don't know about my role in my job. And another thing that people probably don't realize is I'm just like their local Olivia Pope. So that's what people don't know. When I come in, I'm here to fix it. And I come with solutions and a whole bag. And if I don't know, I'm going to figure it out. So, um, that's what, um, I would say are things people probably don't know. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to meet and talk with me this afternoon, Mrs. Francis. I'm also hoping that our students and teachers within career and technical education classes will have a greater insight on what it means to run your own business, host trainings and presentations, but as, as well as be a human resources professional. So again, I thank you for your time this afternoon, and I thank you for all of the great information that you shared with us today. Thank you. All right. Nina Baker, and I am the CTE Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Educator for the Illinois CTE Project. Pro Start again. See, and this is why I edit. <laughs>